the equilibrium constant gives us a benchmark of how much a reaction favors reactants or products. But to really use that benchmark, we have to have something to compare to it. And what we typically use to compare to it is this value Q, which is called the reaction quotient. Q mathematically has the exact same form as the equilibrium expression. It's still the ratio of product concentrations or pressures, nothing different there, raised to their stoichiometric coefficients in the balanced chemical equation, divided by reactant concentrations raised to their respective stoichiometric coefficients, where we're multiplying reactant and product terms within this expression. The only difference between Q and the equilibrium expression for K is that these concentrations are under any conditions. That is, equilibrium or non-equilibrium conditions. What really motivates our use of and study of Q is the fact that comparing it to the value of K tells us the direction in which a reaction will spontaneously move. And we'll see exactly how that works over the next couple of slides. As we mentioned before, the reaction quotient has the exact same form as the equilibrium expression. But the concentrations that we use in this Q do not have to be equilibrium concentrations. They can be concentrations under any conditions, equilibrium or non-equilibrium. Usually the conditions, the concentrations that go into calculating Q are either implied or explicitly stated in a problem. So for the general reaction, A moles of A plus B moles of B goes to C moles of C and D moles of D, where everything is aqueous, so we don't have to worry, for example, about including aqueous and gaseous species and not including solids and liquids, we can write a general expression for Q. Q is equal to the concentration of C raised to the power of its stoichiometric coefficient, a similar expression for D, divided by the concentrations of the reactants raised to their respective coefficients, so the concentration of A raised to the little a power and the concentration of B raised to the little b power, where once again, all four of these concentrations may be equilibrium or non-equilibrium values. The overall situation may be a system in equilibrium or not. Q is a number that we calculate for a given set of reaction conditions at equilibrium or not equilibrium. And by reaction conditions, we really just mean the set of concentrations of A, B, C, and D, for example, that define where the reaction is, how far the reaction has progressed, for example. We've touched on this a little bit, but I really want to clarify now, what is the point of Q? We talked about K as a benchmark, and Q is the number that we compare to K to determine where our reaction is in terms of its extent. In other words, how far has our reaction progressed relative to the equilibrium state? Since chemical systems move spontaneously towards the equilibrium state, calculating Q and comparing it to a given K value helps us determine the direction in which a chemical system will move spontaneously, whether it will go in the forward direction or in the reverse direction. And I really like the graphical display that's here that shows you how this works. So KC is our benchmark. This is going to be a given value that's going to set essentially how far the reaction wants, quote unquote, to go towards reactants or products. So notice in all three of these diagrams that Kc is at the same level. In fact, Kc is independent of reaction conditions, right? It only depends on the nature of the reacting species and the stoichiometric coefficients and, and the concentrations at equilibrium, not on concentrations under a particular set of conditions. So Kc is at the same level in all three graphs. On the left-hand side, we're seeing a situation where QC is less than KC. The C subscript just means with reference to concentration. So here, Q is less than K. Let's think about what this means algebraically using the equilibrium expression, which applies to both QC and KC, right? It's just that in the reaction quotient, in Q, those concentrations don't have to be at equilibrium. QC less than KC means that we have a relatively large concentration of reactants, right? And to represent this, I'll write the concentration of R raised to the R power relatively large and the concentration of P raised to the P power relatively small. 
relative to Kc, remember it's all relative to Kc as our benchmark, we have an excess of reactants. That's key. That tells us that spontaneously the reaction is going to move to generate more products and consume the reactants until the value of Qc is equal to Kc, at which point we've reached equilibrium. So to move towards equilibrium, the reaction generates products or goes in the forward direction. When Qc is equal to Kc, well this just is the equilibrium state, right? When these two are equal, we're at equilibrium. This is one way to tell whether a chemical system is at equilibrium or not. We calculate the value of the reaction quotient, and if it's equal to a given K value, we know that the system's at equilibrium, and in terms of moving in the forward or reverse direction, what we can say is that the reaction will move neither forward nor backward. It will remain in this state for time immemorial, provided the conditions of the reaction don't change. On the right-hand side, we have a situation where Qc is now greater than Kc. This is a different set of reaction conditions. And if we again think about the equilibrium expression and the concentrations within, we'll realize that to make Qc greater than Kc, that means under these conditions we have an excess of product molecules, a large product concentration, and a relatively small reactant concentration. To evolve toward equilibrium, to make Qc approach Kc, it needs to decrease. And the way the reaction system can do that is by consuming some of the product molecules and forming some of the reactant molecules. In other words, the reaction running in reverse. So when Qc is greater than Kc, the reaction will spontaneously run in reverse until the equilibrium state is again achieved. So this is the beauty of Q, and we're going to use Q throughout this chapter and throughout future chapters related to chemical equilibrium to decide a, whether a system is at equilibrium or not, and B, if not, which direction it's going to go in to achieve chemical equilibrium. That's critical, right? That's a critical question when you're looking at a chemical reaction. You want to know, is the system going to move in the direction I want it to move in, right? Am I going to make the stuff I want to make or not? Calculating Q and comparing it to K can help us answer this question. This slide just sums it all up for us. If Q is less than K, then Q must increase to get back to the value of K. That means that the reaction must go forward so that reactants are consumed and products are formed, increasing the value of Q. Remember, P shows up in the numerator of Q, so to increase it, we need to generate P. If Q is greater than K, well then Q needs to decrease in order for Q to eventually equal K. So in that case, the reaction must go in reverse. Products are converted to reactants. Reactants show up in the denominator of the Q expression, decreasing the value of Q as products are consumed and reactants are generated until the point when Q equals K. And at that point, when Q is equal to K, the reaction is at equilibrium and goes neither in the forward nor reverse direction spontaneously. Now, one caveat before I end this video is Keep in mind that chemical equilibria are dynamic, so when we say that Q equals K and the reaction stops, quote unquote, the concentrations stop changing, that doesn't mean that the reaction is not occurring at the microscopic level, right? The rates of the forward and reverse processes are equal at this point. So the forward and reverse reactions are still occurring microscopically, it's just that from our macroscopic viewpoint, in bulk, I like to say, the concentrations are not changing.